As somebody who is so deeply involved in the world of fasting, what are the biggest mistakes you see people making on a regular basis? It's such a good question. It's really loaded. So uh, let me give you the most simple answer first, which is uh, we do the same fast every single day over and over and over again. It's, you know, the, I call them the O matters. Most people got to this point as they started to learn fasting and they felt so good in their fasting window that all they did was eat one meal a day, usually dinner. And the problem with that is eventually you're going to get stuck because we have to, again, go back to our primal ancestors and look at how they lived. And they had a huge variation in when they got food and, and the timing of how they ate. So some days they would make a kill and they would have a feast maybe for 24 hours. They would have plenty of food, maybe 48 hours, and then they'd have to go back out again and start to, uh, to, to find food, which is a fasted state. So when we come to fasting in this modern world, we really have to look at how do we vary that feast famine cycling. And when we're doing the same fast over and over again, it works in the beginning, but then you get stuck. So that would be the first one. The second one is that people think fasting is a free pass to eat whatever you want. And yeah, I mean, the research is pretty convincing that you can eat some pretty toxic food. And if you pair that with like a 16 hour fast, your metabolic markers will all regulate. It's, it's pretty cool. But I've seen people eating the wrong oils, eating refined flours, eating to drinking toxic ingredients like Diet Coke um, and, and NutraSweet laden foods. And what we're seeing is that it's really hard to metabolically switch. It's really hard when your toxic load is that high from food to get into the real healing power of the fat burning state. So I, I would say those are the, the two biggest. And then, of course, my passion, as you know, is that women are not timing it to their cycle. I'm taking a quick break from the episode to ask a small favor from you. Right now, the YouTube stats are showing that 92.3% of you are watching but haven't subscribed to the channel yet. If you're one of these people and you've been enjoying the videos, please take a second and subscribe below. It's going to help the community continue to grow and help bring on bigger and bigger guests over time. I hope you're enjoying this episode and continue to do so, and I thank you ahead of time. I want to pick apart the first point there a little bit and get into the nuances. You mentioned there the fact that a lot of people, and I've been guilty of this too, where you find intermittent fasting and you find a cycle or an eating window that works for you and you just kind of stick with that. Yeah. But the way I see that, and this is just further elaborating on what you said there, fasting is a hermetic stress, a good stress on the body when it's done for the right amount of time, for the right person, yada, yada. Yep. But if you get into that cadence where you're doing the same thing every day, is it correct to see that as the body just gets used to that and then that becomes the new normal? Yes, it's really well said. So think of it like exercise. If you go to the gym and you do the same exercise over and over and over again, at first you'll get some results, but then you're not going to get, your, the results will be more minimal because the body is done adapting. We, we, whenever we want to build the body stronger, we have to force adaptation. And what I saw with the one meal a day people and I, on my YouTube channel so clearly about, I don't know, seven years ago, they all came onto my channel and I saw so clearly how they, people weren't mixing their fast enough. And the, cr the classic statement was, I got great results with fasting and now those results have stopped. Basically, the interpretation of that is you're, you're not applying enough hormetic stress. And so you have two moves at that point. You could either stop fasting for a week or, or two and then go back to it, or you could throw in some longer fasts and then go back into the shorter, which is you know why I like to practice this, the six different length fasts that we talked about the last time. When you mentioned there the fact that people hit a plateau and things don't continue to you know improve with their health... Are you generally speaking from a weight standpoint when they hit that plateau? I think it's more than just weight. I mean, I think people notice the weight the most because that's what we're so focused on. 
But remember when you get, when you fast and you switch over into this fat burning system, you are now in a healing system. So, you know, you can repair your gut, you can reset the immune, the dopamine system, you can reset your immune system, you can get rid of senescent cells. I mean, there's so much magic over there. And so what most people notice is that they're not making as many ketones, they're not getting that same kind of really um, clear mind, powerful energy, great sleep, like, so it's beyond, it's beyond weight loss. Um, they just noticed, God, I don't think this tool is working for me anymore. And if you think about it, Jesse, it's like every diet we've ever gone on, we do this, right? We're like, hey, this is the greatest diet in the world. And then we go on it. We're like, oh my God, I got so much good, so many good results. And we stay on it. We stay on it. We stay on it. And then we go, wait, I don't think this diet's working anymore. So we're now applying the same thing to fasting. And if you want to overcome that, you're just going to need to keep dipping into the hormetic stress that, and use adaptation to your advantage. Well, there's a lot of different benefits, and you've talked about some and a lot of different nuances too. And you mentioned the the female fasting quickly there versus the male. There's nuance between different people and different age and so many different variables. But let's take it to that weight loss example, because I think for a lot of people, that's what brings them to fasting, mm -hmm. at least initially. Yeah. And we'll use, again, that specific example of when they hit a plateau. So we'll, we'll make a hypothetical person here. Somebody's overweight. They start intermittent fasting. Say they do a 16-8. So they're fasting for 16 hours a day, eating within that eight-hour window, and they're seeing results, and they lose 20, 30 pounds, but they hit that that plateau at that point, they don't seem to be losing any more weight. At that point, do you go to some of those different fasts you were talking about? Or do you look at the diet at that point or lifestyle? Let's take this hypothetical situation and help that person out and break through this plateau. Yeah, it's a great question. So let's start. I agree that diet should come in at that point because a lot of people, when they start fasting, they forget that they got to think about diet. So um, I really like three pivotal changes that should pair with your fasting um, that will really help weight loss results. So the first is good oils, not bad oils. And, you know, it's an easy change. You're not, your taste buds are not going to care. But when you go out to eat, you're going to have to start to ask what oils they're cooking your food in. So bad oils are canola, cottonseed, corn, uh, partially hydrogenated, soybean, vegetables, sunflower, safflower. Those are like the big bad oils. So get those out because they're making you insulin resistant. And add in the avocado, the oil, olive oil, the sesame oil, the MCT oil. Those are nourishing healthy oils. Second change, and this is beyond like even counting macros, I'm such a fan of people just turning towards nature's carbs, not man-made carbs. So just like we can't say all fats are the same, we can't say all carbs are the same. So just take out the refined, I don't care if it's gluten-free, I don't care if it's organic, take out the refined flours, the refined sugars, and, and lean into your potatoes, your rices, your fruits, your vegetables. Anything that came from the earth is a better carb. It's going to have more fiber. It's going to have a better blood sugar stabilizer for you. So make sure you're doing nature's, not man-made's. And then the last food change would be just avoid the toxic ingredients. I think the, the thing that has shocked me in watching so many people fast is how many people want to drink Diet Coke or they want to, you know, drink a, a, a soda that has some kind of like st even stevia in it, like in their fasting window. And I just think if we can just take all chemicals out, if we can just drink water and maybe some coffee or some tea in your fasting window, um, I think that really, really helps. So to your point, cleaning up the food system is step one. Second thing, you have two choices if you're getting stuck. One is you can move into a longer fast. So that's choice one. That's going to be a hormetic stress for you. Or you could not fast. That also is going to be a hormetic stress for you. Now, if you're listening to this, you might be like, well, gee, the not fasting sounds a lot better. Might as well do that one first. And you're, you're, you're a bit right. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I have coached that have been avid fasters. They're not losing weight anymore. And the first thing I do is get them to stop fasting. And we go back to food. We look at blood sugar and how to pair meals together. 
And then we go back to fasting. We go to their favorite fast, and then I extend them into a longer fast. And my and for weight loss, just so we're clear, my favorite fast is a 36-hour fast. I have seen it unstick people's weight. That's what the literature shows. That's what we've seen. So it might be that you need to stop fasting for a couple of weeks and then go into, you know, a 36 hour fast. That would be a really good shake, you know, shake it up so that your body can start to to drop weight again. All right. A lot of nuance there. And I really like that piece of stopping fasting. If you're somebody who's caught in a fasting routine and, and doing that reset there. And you mentioned the fact macros, we're not going to count those at least initially. If somebody has applied, you know, taking the chemicals out, the bad oils, and they've cleaned up the diet where they're eating whole foods, is that where you'd start to look at the macros if they're still stuck and look at carbohydrates and how much of those they're consuming? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, to me, there's three versions of keto. Um, I, in, in Fast Like a Girl, I talk about ketobiotic. I feel like in general, it's a good version of keto. It gives you 50 grams net carbs. And just so we're clear, net carbs are total carbs minus the fiber. So if you're eating a lot of vegetables and a lot of fruit with a lot of fiber, you're going to get plenty of carbs in and to satisfy your brain and your taste buds. So I like ketobiotic as like that middle keto. But I've seen clinically that we've had to actually bring people down into low carb sometimes. And low carb can be 10 grams of net carbs. This is like you're eating meat, you're eating protein. Um, I even like, I don't know if we talked about this last time, but I like something called protein cycling, where you're, you're bringing in protein every, every couple of hours, you're bringing in 30 grams of protein. The reason I like that is that it starts to stimulate an amino acid receptor in your muscle that builds your muscle stronger. As your muscle builds, you open up more insulin receptor sites and make yourself more insulin sensitive, which ultimately is going to help you lose weight. So the low keto and then turning around and, and increasing carb I mean, I'm sorry, protein, and then doing that every couple of two to three hours with these 30 gram pulses in, that's like, that's killer. Like that, that you will lose weight really, really well. Um, so that's, a, that's another strategy. Now, the other version of keto beyond ketobiotic is that I often will pit a pull, especially women, up to about 75 grams net carbs. And sometimes I'll even pull women up to 100. Now, let me tell you why. Uh, This is where the thyroid comes into consideration. So with thyroid health, and there's been a lot of talk in the fasting movement about this, with thyroid health, we have to have two things present for your thyroid system, hormone system to work. Um, One is you have to have enough calories. So when people are doing one meal a day, that's not helping with the calorie. You know, it's hard. I mean, you have to get about 1,200 to 1,500 calories in every day to keep the thyroid happy. So what I find with the one meal a dayers is that they just aren't getting enough uh, calories in. Second thing is we really need carbohydrates for thyroid health. So if somebody's got a thyroid problem, I will take their version of keto and put it up to 75 net carbs or up to 100 net carbs. Um, But again, remember, those carbs are coming from fruits and vegetables and so that there's a lot of fiber in them. So that there's a whole lot of nuance in that. But that's kind of how, you know, and I'm sure you've seen this, Jesse, where it's just like, we just say keto, or we just say fasting, and we just like give them these labels. But in within these categories, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of personalization that people should know about. Yeah, that makes sense. And for somebody who gets into lower carb, whether it be on one end of the spectrum, you mentioned going up to 100 grams net a day, all the way down to 10 on the other end of the spectrum. Do you recommend the person doing that? Again, we're using this example here to lose weight, they've hit a plateau, and they've gone through all these different steps to get here. Would you recommend for them on weekends to cycle some extra carbs in? Or would that just be stick with that keto or keto-ish diet until they get to their weight loss goal. How do you feel about cycling in and out? Yeah. It, so for, for men and postmenopausal women, I love taking the weekend and upping your carbs because you're already, you're hanging with friends, you're hanging with family. 
Like it's, I, and I also have just noticed over the years that it's easier to stay disciplined Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday. It's kind of nice to not be as disciplined. So for, for men and for postmenopausal women, I like that idea a lot. For cycling women or perimenopausal women, I want you to increase your carbs at two times of the month. One during ovulation, I called it the manifestation phase in the book, but I, I, I want, you know, day 10 to day 15, bring up those carbs because you need them for your other hormones, but you'll also be able to support the, the thyroid hormones. And then the week before your, your period, bring those carbs up. And then the rest of the time, you can go down into that lower carb. That's how we, that's how we dodge the bullet of getting stuck. That's how we dodge the bullet of the thyroid tanking. Um, it, it, it really, I can't tell you how well that works for women who have an active cycle. That makes sense. And taking this even further, as we start talking about pulsing protein and, and getting the carbs down to the 10 net grams per day, it gets me thinking about carnivore, which is becoming quite popular in, in yeah. today's health world. So again, somebody stuck and they're, they're having a challenge losing weight, do you find that to be a viable option? And have you used that with people with great success? Yeah. So the carnivore diet is fascinating. Um, and I think it's hard for people to wrap their head around a little bit. So let me tell you the science behind it. The thing about meat, especially clean meat, is that there is nothing for your body to react to. So we're back at the oxalate lectin conversation. What we're finding is people with gut dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of bacteria in their gut or the terrain in their gut is off. Yes, when you eat kale, you're going to have an inflammatory response, and that's going to make you feel bloated, puffy. Your body's going to have this experience of feeling thicker than it, than it is. You may even see it on, on the scale. So... We've got to take everything out of your diet that your body could possibly react to, and vegetables are one of them. I, if you eat clean meat, you just don't react. It's, it's crazy. The second thing that the carnivore diet does is it upregulates T regulatory cells. Now, this is really important because the T regulatory cells are part of what balances your immune system. So any autoimmune condition, even I've seen like SIBO, people who are reacting to vegetables all the time, if you just pulse in some carnivore days, you're going to feel all the inflammation go down. You're going to stay in the keto, in that low keto place. You're going to drop weight and you're not going to be hungry. My only complaint about the carnivore diet is it's boring. That, that, I mean, it's hard. That's why you, I like to pulse it in. Like you would pulse it in on, you know, a, you know, a, you know, for two or three days and then go back maybe to your mid-level keto or go what I call hormone feasting foods in the book. But it's, it's a great reset for that metabolism if you're looking for that. And Mindy, you personally, it sounds like you play around with it periodically pulsing it in. Yep. What would it look like over a month period? What would your diet look like? Last time we focused a lot on the fasting. Today, I want to get a lot more into the foods and, and how you go about eating. Give us a month and how you might pulse that in and, and how you vary your diet over that period. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's it's a bit of a loaded question because remember, I for most of my 40s and early 50s, I've been eating and fasting for my cycle. So um, if in those days and if you have a cycle... Um, I like pulsing in carnivore day one to about day 10 or day nine, and then day 16 to day 19, because you want to keep glucose down. Those are great opportunities to use the principles that are of healing of the carnivore diet. I'm now seven months in to having no cycle. And so I'm, I'm, I think I'm heading into that official year where I can say I'm, I'm menopausal. So I pulse it in on a weekly basis and I do it based off of what, what I need. So, um, you know, I would say if you look at like a 30 day period for me, um, it's, it's now more weekly where five days a week, I am looking at about 17, 18 hours of fasting every day. That's my comfort level. 
But then one day a week, I stretch my fast and I just do dinner. One day a week, I do nothing. When, during eating during that time, my preferred way of eating is keto, this ketobiotic way. But I've also, as a 53-year-old woman, I'm upping my protein a lot more. So I'm breaking my fast with protein. I'm trying to get my, my fighting weight, the weight I like to be at, is 130 pounds. So I'm really working to get 130 grams of protein in every day, which is a lot to try to get in. So um, currently, that is what my focus is, is low carb, low nature's carbs, more protein. Um, and then I'm doing it more on a weekly basis right now as my body settles into a postmenopausal place. Um, the, other, the other place I, I use it is like, um, I'm going, I, I don't know if I told you this last time, I'm doing a, a fitness series with Tony Horton. Do you know who Tony Horton is? Yeah, previous guest to the show. Ah, nice. So P90X, I was a huge fan of P90X. I did it like every day for three years when I was in my early 40s. So I'm a huge Tony fan. So I taught him how to time fitness to the menstrual cycle. So we're, we're he's got a whole set of videos that he's putting out called Power Sync, where we're going to show women how to do this. It's super cool. Anyways, we're filming next week. So, okay, let's just, you know, I'm if you're going to be on camera, you want to look as fit as possible, that's where I'm like, hey, a couple of days of carnivore to just lean out, but you're not going to lose muscle. So I, I share that as my personal journey, but if somebody was having that same, you know, they wanted to look good for a wedding or they wanted to look good for some event, throw in a couple of days of carnivore, it just, I mean, it leans you out really quickly. You quickly touched on this program you're going to be filming, and now I'm, my curiosity has peaked. My hunch is that when it comes to exercise, you would time it, when it comes to the menstrual cycle, you would time it a lot like you're fasting within that cycle. So you have that period early on in the cycle where you can fast harder. Then you have your ovulation where you have to slow down a bit. Then you go back into the second power phase where you can fast hard again. And then you have to take it easy till the end of the cycle. So is it. it is it correct to, to say that during those two periods when you can fast harder, that's when you'd want to time those workouts that are more intense? Yeah. Yeah. And you absolutely got it right. And this is why I named it the power phases, because I wanted to show that you could power up on your fast. You could power up on your keto because these are tools that we've been using to get a better version of our body, you know, to increase performance. But you can also power up on your HIIT training. You can power up on if you want to run a marathon, those are good times. If you're a big CrossFitter and you want to push your workout, those are good times. When the hormones come in and they're peaking the week before our cycle and ovulation, we need to look at those different because those hormones are affecting us. With ovulation, I called it manifestation phase, you have the most amount of testosterone that you'll get the whole the, a woman's whole cycle. So why don't we use that testosterone to build muscle? So heavier weights, but then you want those weights to be slow reps because you have the most amount of estrogen as well. And estrogen is going to make the ligament, which is the part of the muscle that attaches to the actual bone. It's going to make the ligament very, very tight, and it's going to make your tendon, which is the connection from the ligament to the muscle, it's going to make it very loose. So you're actually more prone to injury during ovulation, but you have all this testosterone. So this insight that I had is why are we not cycling our workouts in a monthly cycle and using testosterone to really build muscle in the best way possible um, when it shows up. The week before your period, same rule applies. You don't want cortisol up. So pushing your workouts is not a, is not a great idea, just like pushing your fasts is not a great idea. I called it the nurture phase because really it's recovery. It should be yoga. It should be hiking. It should be, you know, if you don't feel like working out, don't push through that mentality of, I got to work out, I got to work out. So you're absolutely right. It's the same principles with a, just a few little nuances in it. Just to make sure I got that nuance when it comes to ovulation. So it's a little bit different than fasting, I'm hearing, because 
if you exercise the right way, you can take advantage during ovulation of the testosterone. That's right. And get gains during that period. That's but right. at the end of the cycle for fasting and for exercise, you want to be gentle. That's right. That's right. It's a, it's it's a, once you understand the principles of when these hormones are coming in and out, you start to go, "Oh my god, I can time everything to it." And that's and that's what I'm seeing women do. I even had a really cool discussion the other day with uh, Kate Northrup, and she times her whole work schedule to her cycle. That was crazy. Like it was really interesting to hear what she does. Well, let's extrapolate this out then and talk about we've done exercise fasting. You're you're touching on work here. For women who are still in that phase of their life where they're having a monthly cycle. Let's talk about when they'd want to do these different activities, when they would be, you know, when their physiology would be most ideal. Yeah. So there, there's this really interesting, I'll start with day one, but I just want to point out that the first two days when a woman is bleeding, there's like an interesting transition. We're going from high progesterone, all of a sudden progesterone crashes and estrogen is going to start to build. Those first 10 days, estrogen is starting to build. But the first two days of your cycle, your brain actually has access to both hemispheres, both the right and the left hemisphere. So you're crazy intuitive those first two days of your cycle. And like words might not come out exactly how you want it because the brain is, is really using both hemispheres. So, and I'll explain why that's important in a moment. Then about three days in, estrogen starts to build. As estrogen builds, our mental clarity builds and our verbal processing skills improve. And so you become from about day two all the way through into ovulation till day 15, that is a really good time to power up on your work. So my, what Kate said is she she actually does more Zoom calls. She's She puts on more projects onto her calendar. So it is definitely, if you are a rushing woman, if you are a type A like me, and you just want to go, 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 do it on around day two to day 15. When you come out of ovulation, again, there's like this dip in in your um, in your hormones, but you're really starting to build progesterone. You know, your body's starting to ramp up. So as we move into that luteal phase, we move into that back half of the cycle. We have to start to think a little bit about slowing down. Now, it's not as important until you get to about day 19, day 20. And what Kate says she does is she only she cuts her workload in half, and she does everything slower. She spends a little more time in the morning in her meditation and her morning work. She talked about how she even when she walks her kids to school, she walks a little slower. She doesn't put as many social events on her calendar. So she uses that truly like a nurture time to slow down and honor what progesterone wants because progesterone doesn't want cortisol to be high. So what she does is she just keeps her cortisol in check the, as she moves into that back half of her cycle. So, it, and, and what's cool about this is even for postmenopausal women, you know, you can even look at some of the things we know about the moon. You know, a lot of people will say like at a full moon, you're super creative and you're super, you, you know, it's a great time to start a project. Well, the, the full moon often correlates with ovulation. So that ovulation period, according to, to Kate, is a fertile time. It's a great time for creativity. Well, yeah, that makes sense because during ovulation, we had estrogen at its peak, testosterone at, at its peak, and a little bit of progesterone. So, you know, you really, if you're listening to this the first time and you're like, what the hell is she saying? Um, hang with me and because the more you understand that the way a woman's body works is very ebb and flow. And so our workload should ebb and flow. Our workout should ebb and flow. Our fast should ebb and flow. Everything should ebb and flow with these hormones. And once you learn the dance for yourself, it becomes much easier. And, and my new, I don't know if you and I talked about this, but one of my, my favorite for postmenopausal women is you could look at the moon and just decide 
Workload's going to be bigger in the waxing mood moon, and then I, I'm going to relax more in the waning moon. We did touch on that at the end of our last conversation. So a lot of fascinating stuff here, and, and it brings up a couple different thoughts for me. One being that for women, unfortunately, this information isn't being taught on a, a grand scale. And there's two different layers. First of all, having you, you have to get the information listening to something like this, and it's not being talked about a lot. And then secondarily, for a lot of women, they're working nine to five jobs. And, and even if they are tuned into what we're talking about, their schedule, because of the way society is set up these days, isn't going to allow them to have variation in their days throughout the month. So it's like, okay, great. Now I know this, but you know, I have the same grind every day at work when I go to the office. So I feel for women and hopefully we're doing a good job here of at least tuning them into this information. And, and over time, as it becomes more widely known, hopefully employers can, can take this into consideration and how they, you know, how they, they have women working with them and, and, and embrace this, this nuance in this dance. That's my hope is that we've got to start the conversation. So if you're a woman listening to this and you're like, what? And like, you know, you can't even wrap your head around it. Keep, keep learning because as more of us come together and talk about this, then we're, we're going to find a pattern that works. And a couple of things that I love that Kate said is again, she does everything slow that week before. So if work demands are really, really high, you know, don't, don't pair a high work demand with a marathon the week before your period. Like those are, those two are not going to fit together or start a new diet, or maybe you're going to like party like a rock star on the, on the weekend. Like those are not good habits to pair together. If you know, work is really high, you're going to have to really protect your downtime. You're going to have to create more space in your schedule in between the stress that week before your period. Um, sec second thing is that um, I love this idea. We talked, and this was an interview we did on my Resetter podcast. Um, there, She said, you know, we live in this culture where we're so programmed to answer everybody right away when they email us, when they message us on social media. She's like, if it's day 22 or day 23, could you just say to some emails like, hey, I'll get back to you or say to some people, I'll get back to you in 48 hours. Like we don't always have to be in that instant satisfaction rush, rush mode. So I think there's little nuances for the, for the modern woman that we can take into consideration. And to your point, you know, how, how can we integrate this from a corporate level? And um, I think it's just really understanding women's hormonal needs. And what I love, love, love about this idea is that if you're, let's say you're a CEO of a company and you're listening to this and you're like, wait a second, I could never like allow the women in my, my thousand people in my corporation to like slow down the week before their periods. Um, what I'm saying is let's teach women how to nurture themselves that week and, and, and see where they can slow down. But what you're going to notice is if you honor that week before her period, you're going to get a more productive woman at the other times of your cycle. But what we're doing right now is we're just having women push on through every day of the month and that's destroying her hormones. And now you've got PCOS, you've got infertility, you have mood disorders, you have menopause, perimenopause, like all these hormones, you have hormonal cancers, all of these like issues are, are coming to the surface for women because we're not honoring and learning how to teach a woman to ebb and flow with her hormones. And I think another layer to this too is knowing what is actually replenishing as a woman or as a man who wants to do self-care because a lot of these biohacks in the health and wellness space, whether it be to go in the sauna, go into an ice bath, go to a spin class, whatever people are doing as self-care, if they're in a position of that cycle as a woman who's cycling or just you know, a man or woman who's at any point in, in their life who is burnt out and they're using these things as a way to replenish, they may be further layering on to the stress that while they're thinking they're doing something good for their body, they're actually depleting. So we need to redefine exactly. 
what self-care is and what's actually replenishing to the body. Oh my God, this is so, such a good point. Thank you for, for stating this because I'm watching all these people jump into cold plunges. And the first thing I thought was like, how should a woman do that? Like what's, because there's a cortisol response when you jump into a cold plunge. So I would say, just don't do it the week before your period. Like that would be a simple, a simple hack. Whereas a sauna, like an infrared sauna actually nourishes the parasympathetic. So it would be actually a really good thing to do the, the week before your period. So I think that the next evolution for the biohacking movement is to start to look at these things we deem as, as healthy and helpful to the body. And let's make sure we're clear on where they fit in the, in this ebb and flow of the menstrual cycle. Um, and, and it's really, I mean, it's one of the things that I see that I do not like in the biohacking movement is that we just say, this is amazing. This is the science. And then we leave women, women's hormonal ebbs and flows out of that conversation. Well, let's further elaborate. You mentioned the sauna being parasympathetic. What are some of the other things that somebody tuning in right now who wants to have more of that balance in their life? What are some things that they can do that actually calm the system? Yeah. Well, infrared saunas are my favorite. Um, I mean, you you really prime the parasympathetic nervous system. And let, let's talk about that system for a moment, because I believe that one of the th reasons that fasting has worked so well is it's primed this metabolic switch where you can go from sugar burner to fat burner. And so we're, we're using a switch we weren't using before. But there's another switch, and it's your nervous system switch. And you should be going from sympathetic to parasympathetic. And if you aren't prime, and that can be timed to your cycle. Power phases, you can go sympathetic. Uh, nurture phase, you want to go more parasympathetic. And, and manifestation, ovulation time, you want to go more, more parasympathetic. So same concept. So now let's look at the tools that we have. Infrared sauna is a parasympathetic primer. It is phenomenal to do at ovulation and the week before your period, fabulous. Um, whereas, like I said, cold plunges, although long-term it resets your dopamine system, long-term it has a really good effect on your, um, on your uh, parasympathetic nervous system, in the moment, it is a sympathetic trigger. And I'll, and I'll use myself as an example. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a retreat. And uh, we were in not an infrared sauna, we were in just one of those outdoor saunas, which is probably more sympathetic driven. I got into that, it was really hot, I was sweating like crazy, and my heart started pounding. And then I went into the cold plunge, and then my heart started pounding more. I got out of the cold plunge, I was dizzy, I had a glucose monitor on, and I saw that my glucose spiked in that whole experience. That was a sympathetic response. Now, I, I'm moving into menopause, um, so I don't have a cycle to time to, but it was insight as a menopausal woman, I'm trying to preserve progesterone. And so the next day I opted out of both of those things. I was like, you know what? That was too taxing to my nervous system that I had this really hard heart palpitation, blood sugar goes up. That wasn't right for me. Now, did I want to do it the next day? Of course. Like I was euphoric when I got out and all the dopamine hits that you get, but I tapped into what my nervous system needed and said, you, I think I'm already stuck and sympathetic. I need to, to avoid that so I don't get locked in this fight or flight nervous system. And I think part of the challenge too is that so many things in day-to-day -day life are sympathetic, whether it be the That's go, right. go, go with work and you know, taking care of kids and, and taking kids to different activities. And there is so much going on. We, you talked about being connected with email and like, there's so much happening that brings us into the system where we're go, go, go and, and activated that if we're doing these things, again, just tying back to what we're talking about there, where our self-care is also activating us, it's, it's leads to this cycle of, of trouble. Yeah. And I think that's, we really need to to pay attention to what you just said, um, because just because a health influencer gets up on Instagram and says, this is going to be change your life, what I want all women to say is, okay, well, where does that fit into my hormonal picture? Now, 
you know, if you're perimenopause and postmenopause, you really have to think of progesterone. Uh, you're losing progesterone. We've done thousands of Dutch tests in my in my company, and psh, crazy. I have not seen one woman over forty with enough progesterone. And a part of that is because we're living in this really intense, um, rushing woman sort of world, this modern world. So if you know your progesterone is going down, I'm not saying don't cold plunge. I'm saying pulse your cold plunges. Don't do it every day. Pay attention to things like I talked about where my heart was racing and I went, mm, not, not the right tool for me today. Does that mean I'm not going to get a cold plunge? No. Like I want to get one in my backyard, but I want to learn how to use it to work with my sympathetic and parasympathetic and match it to my stress levels. The, the other tool you, you asked about what we could do for the parasympathetic is red light. Red light's super relaxing. So can we lean into red light that week before the per our period? Can we leave it, lean into red light um, at ovulation? And if I'm postmenopausal, could I lean into red light at the end of a really stressful day and just put some red light on me to just calm the nervous system down? It's, it's these two opposing pieces of our, our nervous system and our metabolic system that is the elevation of the conversation around both biohacking and food and fasting is it's really the in and out and knowing how to time that to whatever your hormonal needs. That is, is what we should be doing as women. I want to jump back to the food piece. We talked about carnivore and we talked about the fasting piece, which ties in. You mentioned there when we were talking about carnivore, the plant toxins and the fact that there are certain things that are in plants that are classically known to be healthy, whether it be, you know, kale or spinach, a lot of different plants. How do we know if we're somebody that needs to be wary of those? And then what are the big ones that we want to look out for? Yeah, it's a great question. So the first thing is, I just want everybody, both men and women, to think about when you eat a meal, you should be energized afterwards. If you're not energized after a meal, if you're not, if you don't have more mental clarity, if something changed adversely in your body from that meal, then I want you to go back and look at that meal and go, what was in that that didn't work for me? A lot of times it's just putting the right combination together of foods, you know, like we don't put enough protein with every meal. We don't put enough fat with every meal. So, so it could be as simple as that. Now, to your question, when we're looking at oxalates and lectins, and I, and I talked to Stephen Gundry about this, and I, and I, I know you've probably had him on your show, and, and it's, it is like when you write a book, you have to stay very clear and in one lane. And then there's nuance that needs to be discussed. And that's what Stephen said is... If you have a healthy gut, you're most likely okay with these oxalates and lectins every once in a while. You're not going to have a problem with it. Um, but if you have an unhealthy gut, you've been on multiple rounds of antibiotics. You've been on a woman who's been on birth control for many years, steroid use. All of that is what can change the inner lining of the gut. And then when you eat an oxalate or a lectin, you're going to notice bloating. That's a big one. You're going to be constipated. Um, that's another one, or you're going to be exhausted. If one of those three things are happening when you eat a salad, then you've got, you've got to avoid those oxalates and lectins for a short period of time to balance the system out. Now, to your question of which one's the worst, this is, this is where, you know, we got kale, right? Like, why is kale, like, everybody villainizing kale? Well, think about when you when you when you wash kale, the water beads like they don't soak in. They like stay on the outside. It's like it's waterproof. Well, what is that film on the outside of a kale leaf? And that is packed with oxalates and lectins. So, if you eat kale and you get bloated, you should avoid kale. Um, and same thing with some of the other ones, like spinach almonds are a big one that we see in the keto movement. A lot of people are doing nuts, but raw almonds can be, a, or almonds in general can be a, an issue. But then if you do sprouted almonds, you have some enzymes in there to help you break it down. So, you know, I think the best thing, because I know everybody wants the absolute, 
But what I'm trying to teach is a personalized nutritional approach. So can you just look at how you're reacting to your food? And if you're reacting with bloating, constipation, low energy, brain fog, something in that meal didn't work. Okay. Well, let's take a step back from there and say you are somebody who is reacting to those foods or you're unsure and you want to get back to baseline and rebuild the gut. Other than removing those foods, what's step one to rebuilding the gut? Honestly, and I know I'm like the poster child for fasting, but I just have seen so many people heal is you want to go into those longer fasts. One day a week, throw a 24-hour fast in. When I did that in my clinic, I literally took all the supplements that I had ever given anybody for any kind of gut dysbiosis and and we just we stopped we stopped prescribing those. We stopped give, you know recommending them because we found one 24-hour fast was enough if you could do it every week, it was enough to start to change the terrain inside the gut, get rid of the bad bacteria and create an environment where the good bacteria could grow. Now, If you pair that post-fast with three different types of foods, the polyphenol, the probiotic, and the prebiotic foods, what you've done in one day is that you have have changed the terrain inside your gut, you have gotten rid of the bad, and then you come in and you feed the good. You do one day a week like that and your microbiome will start to change. I've seen it work for thousands of people. So to me, that's your go-to over a supplement. Okay, let me just highlight what you said there. So we want to remove the plants that are causing the damage, take 24 hours and fast, and then replenish the gut after that with prebiotics, probiotics, and polyphenols. That's right. That's right. And some really good ones that are low in oxalates are like olives. Uh, dark chocolate, um, uh, you know, even sauerkraut. Like every every person I've ever talked to about the oxalate lectin uh, issue says when you ferment a, a vegetable, you get rid of those toxins in the vegetable. So like a classic meal that I'll have post uh, 24 hour fast is avocado because I love it. And then I will put a, a cup of sauerkraut. I, I've got some golden sauerkraut that I love. It's got some turmeric in it. Put that in there. And then I'll put some chia seeds and hemp seeds in it. Um, and I just look at it like I'm feeding the gut bacteria that I just created this environment. And now I'm feeding it what it might need to be able to let those good guys grow. So when it comes to probiotics, the obvious question is fermented foods versus a probiotic capsule. We now know you're a fan of the the sauerkraut and the probiotic food. Yeah. Is a probiotic supplement something you'd layer on on top of that? You could. Now, here's the thing I want to th- think about with the microbiome. What, what I do with my fermented food is I try to get as big of a variety as I can. So I've got fermented yogurts, some that come from cow yogurt. I've got ferment cocoa yo is one of my favorite. It's coconut yogurt that's fermented. Um, I love doing raw kefir, so I'll do that. Um, if you came into my refrigerator right now, you'd see about 15 different jars of sauerkraut, and they all are fermented, different fermented vegetables. The reason that I do that is because I'm looking for this uh, increasing the diversity of my gut. So we have about 7,000 different species of bacteria in our gut. And if we eat the same foods over and over again, or we take the same probiotic over and over again, we create a monoculture where we're allowing a certain, even though they're good, we're allowing a certain set of bacteria to become strong and leaving out the other bacteria. So, you know, when you look at a probiotic, I mean, the best probiotic on the planet maybe has, you know, 100 billion CFUs uh, in it and and maybe at the best, like 100 different strains of bacteria, but you have 7,000 different strains. So if you end up taking the same probiotic over and over and over again, you're now creating this monoculture. The name of the game with the microbiome is diversity. Diversity of sauerkrauts, diversity of vegetables, diversity of meats, like stop eating the same foods over and over again. When when I go to a restaurant, I have a, one rule. What do I not normally eat? 
That is the first thing that I look at on the menu. I don't think, oh, what does my taste buds want? I think, what do my microbes want? Because I'm, you know, like last night, I had salmon. I went out to eat. I had salmon. I hadn't had salmon in like weeks. And But at home, I have grass-fed steak all the time. And then the, one of the other options was lamb. I had just had lamb the week before. So we've got to just, we got to think bigger when it comes to the microbes. They want more diversification is what they're looking for in our food sources. And if we do that, there's not a need for a probiotic. The only time I come in with the probiotic is if we're if somebody had been on steroids or somebody had had to go on antibiotics and we just need a little extra help to replenish that. As you're talking about the diversity of food, I couldn't help but notice you mentioned different meats in there. And usually when people are talking about eating diversity and feeding the gut microbiome, they're talking about different plants and eating the rainbow. How does different meats impact the microbiome? Well, they have amino acids in it, and amino acids are a fuel to the microbes. So, yes, fiber is a, is a huge piece that we're that that of fuel source that you need. But this amino acid profile is really, really important because we've got a little bit in our world right now of plant based carnivore sort of arguing, and I'm like, it's all good. It is all good. Just open it up and diversify it and understand these principles we're talking about. But when we look at meat, you've got amino acids. And amino acids are, are, are the best in meat. You can't find as many of them in plants. So, And those amino acids are going to feed s certain bacteria that the plants can't feed. I've never heard anybody talk about it that way. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's the that's the major thing is that we're and and then now let's take it one step further. What do your microbes make? Well, they make like one of the greatest neurotransmitters on the planet, serotonin, that keeps you happy and feeling good. So I need plants to be able to feed those microbes that make serotonin, but I also need foods that are high in like tyrosine and tryptophan to be able to feed those microbes as well. So it, we got to go back to a more complete diet, not looking at, and this is my problem with both carnivore and, and vegan, is we get really rigid in the amount of foods that we eat. And I'm just saying, let's open it all up and the microbes will be happy. As we navigate through this conversation, we're getting a good idea of what your diet looks like. I noticed when you're talking about fermented foods, you mentioned, I think it was cow dairy yogurt. Talk about, because that's a controversial one. A lot of people, yeah. you know, don't have cow dairy, or if they do, it's fermented, like in your case. Talk about how you how you factor that in and why that's a food you include. It's it's such a good question. So here's how I can explain it. The the best milk source for the human body is your mother's milk. And um, if you look at the molecule size of human mother's milk, and I know we, this is a podcast, you'll have to you'll have to go to YouTube to see this, but um, you know it's like a moderate molecule size. When we look at cow's milk, it's huge. It's like ten times the molecule size of mother's milk. And when we look at something like goat and sheep, it's a little more similar to our mother's milk uh, molecule size, which is why a lot of people can do goat, they can do sheep, um, so that they can their our digestive systems can break that down easier because they were built to break down mother's milk. They weren't built to break down a lactose molecule that's ten times bigger than humans human mother milk, mother's milk. But there's a workaround. And that is if we don't do pasteurized dairy, uh, cow's dairy. When we are doing the raw dairy, you have left the probiotic piece in there and you have left the enzymes in there. And the enzymes are critical for helping you break down this large molecule size. So I'm not a fan of, even if it's grass-fed pasteurized dairy, that's not, some people aren't going to be able to handle that. That's not a great source for your gut microbiome. But now if you do raw, you bring in the probiotics, you're bringing in the enzymes, and you're able to handle that molecule size better and get the benefit of, of those two uh, components of raw dairy that can really heal the gut. It's like, it's, it's like the fat conversation. 
you know, pasteurized and raw dairy are not the same animal, even though we call it dairy and it comes from a cow. You know, it's the same thing with fat. We say fat, but there's good fat and the bad fat. Carbs, there's man-made, there's processed. It's what we're doing to these, this food that is destroying our microbiome. So just let it be in its most natural state. It's all very nuanced. And that's why the long form conversation is so important to get into the weeds on a lot of this. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So we know lectins and oxalates, we talked about how depending where you're at along the health spectrum, you need to be wary of including those. What other foods do we need to be wary of when it comes to our gut health, things that can disrupt that? Yeah. Well, gluten, I, you know, I don't know, you know, a lot of people say, well, I can handle gluten. Yeah. Over time, eventually that's going to catch up with you. And the biggest challenge that we have with gluten is that it's how they make it, how they process it. And um, I don't know if you've had this conversation on your podcast before, but there's two major problems with gluten. One is glyphosate. So, you know, it is damaging the microbes. It's also damaging our brain. It is a systemic inflammatory pesticide. It's an endocrine disruptor. There's, there's nothing good about glyphosate. So there's that. But when we're talking about the microbes, we have to remember that the type of wheat that's being grown, at least here in America, has a, a, a special hybrid of wheat, and it has a component in it called BT toxin. And this BT toxin was bred into this new style of meat of wheat so that if a bug came and tried to eat the wheat, the bug would literally die. That's the purpose of having BT toxin bred into the new form of wheat. Well, what's your microbiome made up of? It's, it's made up of bugs. So if you are eating, even if it's organic, gluten or wheat, you know, there's gluten in a lot of things, what's happening is you're destroying your microbiome. Now, you might not be noticing it as constipation or bloating. You might be noticing it as brain fog. You might be noticing it as depression. You might be noticing it as aches and pains. I have yet to see anybody do well on, on a gluten diet or, or having gluten in their, in their diet. There are some workarounds. So we're, we're hearing a lot more about sprouted and ancient grains. So when we hear about the sprouted, now you're bringing an enzyme back in to help break it down so it's not just a toxic bomb to the gut. When we're dealing with an ancient grain, a lot of those don't have that BT toxin in it because it's an ancient version of wheat that we used to have. I was born in 1969. We In the 70s, Nobody had it. Nobody had a peanut allergy. Nobody had a wheat problem because we weren't. We didn't have this BT toxin, and we didn't have glyphosate at this time. Um, if I go to Europe, I'll eat wheat because they, you know, typically the 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 especially in France and Italy, the laws around um, the uh, the type of wheat, the the respect for this ancient style of wheat is 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 much bigger. So I think gluten is is a, a real big challenge that most people should take out. Okay, so we got gluten, we got lectins, we got oxalates. What else is disrupting the gut? Um, well, and then we've got our you know our chemicals for sure. So uh, you know read your read your labels because any synthetic chemical, um, and this is your red dyes, this is your nitrates, this is you know any chemical that you can't pronounce in a label is going to damage the gut. I interesting enough, it probably falls down on on a lower tier um, because. Uh, Gluten and, and um, lectins are, are definitely becoming more of an insult to the microbiome. But you got to look at your chemical load. And then we're back at, we're back at fats again. The, these highly processed inflammatory fats are like, you know, I like to think of it like you have these little pets inside your gut. And they're this, they're there. They want to make you happy. They want to like give you energy and pull nutrients out of your food and make you neurotransmitters and support your immune system. And then you go and you decide you're going to have a, a hamburger with commercial meat and a hot and a bun with gluten and a bunch of fries. And you have just like destroyed these microbes. You have like decimate them like it's a big bomb that goes in there. 
And you might be a little sleepy, you might not notice a big difference from it, but you've totally wiped out this these little pets inside your gut that are going to do everything you want in life and everything you want in your health. So the toxic oils, the gluten, the and yes, the oxalates and lectins, if you've got that issue, um, the synthetic chemicals, the, it's the Western diet. You know, it's everything that it's like, just avoid the Western diet and start eating things without a label. We talked about probiotics and your thoughts on those when it came to gut health. Let's expand beyond gut health and talk about supplements in general and things you'd recommend to people to at least consider. Yeah. Well, okay. So the first thing about supplements, just so we're clear on my philosophy, is I look at a supplement as exactly what the word says. It's a supplement to a good, healthy diet and good lifestyle. So I cycle supplements. I, you will never find me on the same supplement over and over and over again. And this is what I've done with my patients for years. Like you go in, like if you have to use a probiotic, I think like a probiotic is great post-antibiotic. If you have to use an antibiotic, go in with a probiotic for 30 to 90 days and, and then eat the way we're, ta we're talking about. So for starters, we need to pulse it. Second. I really can't say enough about making sure that you understand the toxins that are in your supplements, lead being a huge one. And this is where it's really sneaky. Like, how do you know if there's lead in your, in, or some kind of chemical in your supplement? Well, make, follow your brands. Like I have some very specific brands that, I, that I've seen how they have built, um, that have made their supplements. I know their supplements are food-based and they're grown from food. And I've like a couple of these brands, I've actually been in their warehouse and seen that they test for different levels of heavy metals. So we got to know what the regulation is around toxicity. Um, cheaper when it comes to supplements is not better. In fact, in some cases, you may not, you may, you might actually be doing more harm than good. So we want to cycle in and out of them. We want to make sure they're clean. Um, and then the last part, and this one is really blows me away, is how many people take a supplement for years and I'll ask them, how's it working for you? And they're like, oh, I don't know. How would I measure it? Um, well, you should see a change. And you either need to see a change on a blood test or you need to feel the change. If you don't, it's probably not working for you. Vitamin D is a great example. Just because you take vitamin D doesn't mean you're absorbing vitamin D. So if you're trying to build your vitamin D levels up, which we all should be focused on, are you testing that on a monthly basis? It's an easy test to do. You can do it on yourself. You know, you can go to your own lab now. It's Blood tests have become easier and easier. So are you seeing that measurement improve? If not, you may be on the wrong vitamin D and you got to switch up the source. So those are those are my three major um, issues that I think we have to think about because we're a little supplement crazy. You know, we've gone from, I don't want to take a medication to, but I'll take a supplement. Well, I think there's something about it where it's it's tangible. We feel like we're really doing something. And, and to be honest, if you have the financial means, it is one of the easier things to do if you're looking to take healthy steps in the right direction. So you gave us a little tidbit there. You mentioned vitamin D, but we know none of these supplements go without testing to make sure that, you know, we're within that range we want to be and we're cycling constantly. But what other supplements would we want to consider? Oh, it's a great question. So this kind of ties into what I mentioned before. Um, so there's a couple like standard ones that I think everybody should think about. For starters, and I and I don't have any invested, just so we're really clear, like I have no financial investment in this product. I just really love it. And I love the human behind it. And that's Ion Biome. I think they're called uh, Nature of Intelligence or Intelligence of Nature now. They keep switching their name. But what, what Zach Bush did in that supplement is he found a, a, a bacteria that was in low level layers of dirt that we're not getting access to anymore that heals a leaky gut. And I have seen miracles with that supplement. It's one of the rare few that I think everybody should be on. Um, I think vitamin D, again, I think everybody should be checking their vitamin D levels on a regular basis. 
Um, I think when we look at an omega supplement, we really need to get out of this, oh my gosh, I'm going to power up on omega-3 because you really need a balance of omega-3, 6, and 9. And so if you've cleaned up your diet and you've brought down your omega-6s and you up your omega-3s through supplementation, even if it's a clean supplementation, you actually have put yourself in an inflammatory response now. So I like a couple of supplements that I use. Um, Pure Form is one. Vista One and Two from Systemic Formulas. They have three, six, nine, all in a balance. So it's you know, and this is why working with a practitioner, understanding this as opposed to just saying, "Oh, I guess I need omega three and popping onto Amazon, and and all of a sudden, you know, you just buy the the, the cleanest supplement or the the supplement you think is going to work." Um, I think we really need to understand what it's doing and how toxic toxic is it and what's my exit strategy with that supplement. I think that is where we go and we we can really change those that look. Um, but outside of that, you know, I think there's some great like like organ meats. I don't know, Jesse, if you're an organ meat supplement fan. Through um, supplements, yes. Yes. So I'm I know I'm not going to eat liver all the time. So I probably need to make sure that I that I get it in some kind of supplementation because I do get that it's important. Um, people who don't methylate well, we know that there's certain versions of B12 that that they can lean in to help them methylate better. So you know there you can kind of go off a of personalization after that. You mentioned there when you're talking about toxins and supplements, you mentioned lead which got me thinking about part of your story where you had a heavy metal problem and you needed to detox that. So take us yeah. to what point that was in your health journey and what you did to remedy that. Yeah, it's such a good question. I um so my that the short version of that story is that at 40 I really I really had one focus and that was a number on the scale. And I, and I had told myself at like 38, I want to be in the best shape of my life uh, when I hit 40. So sure enough, 40 came. I was like, I had worked out a ton. I had restricted food. I didn't know about fasting back then. I was actually pretty paleo. Um, I had done a ton of supplements. Like I did everything. I did everything. And I felt amazing. Um, by 42, 43, my health had completely unraveled. And I hadn't done anything. I hadn't changed anything. I kept that lifestyle going. And what I realized is that in those first three years, which is very common for a lot of women, I was starting to go into this perimenopausal phase. Now, as you, in the initial phases of perimenopause, estrogen goes up and down and up and down. Like there are drastic changes in estrogen. That roller coaster ride of estrogen triggers certain toxins to come out of your system, lead being the biggest one. So lead came out of my system and it went up into the brain because that's what it'll do is it'll go up into fatty nervous tissue, which is what the brain is. And I started to notice depression for the first time in my life, uh, I, recalling words. That was crazy to me. Like I would be in the middle of a conversation. I'm like, what was I saying? Like there was literally like a whole thought would stop. I would walk into a room and not know why I walked into the room. I forgot stuff all the time. And what I realized is that this hormonal ride that I was now on was causing lead to come out of the tissues. And if you think about what menopausal women go through, you know, there's a lot of talk about osteoporosis. Okay, well, what? why does a woman get osteoporosis as she goes through menopause? Well, or through that transition, well, lead's coming out of the bone, destabilizing the bone, making, because it was in there, creating some stability. And so it's changing the inner matrix of the bone. So it's osteoporosis is a byproduct of this lead. It can be of the lead coming out, but where did that lead go? And it went up mostly into the brain. And so that's where I had to really go into some deep detoxing to, to deal with that. So a lot of nuance I want to dig into within this. Where do you think that lead came from? It's a great question too. So, um, well, the first thing is that we have tested thousands, probably hundreds of thousands by now, um, have uh, heavy metal tests. Uh, nobody has been free of lead. 
I have not seen anybody with a clean lead um, profile. Uh, I, you know, I was born in 1969, leaded gas- gasoline, leaded paint. It was, it, we didn't, we didn't pull that out of our, many of the common things we were exposed to. Um, I don't know if you know that there's actually some interesting studies done on learning disabilities of children that sit in classrooms that have old classrooms that have lead paint on them. So just because it, we look at the wall and we're like, hey, how could that come off into the air? You actually are, there is an off-gassing of lead that we will breathe in and, and it can be from paint and it can be it go into our nervous system. So a lot of it is just the time I grew up. Uh, we don't have that as much now. The second thing though is it's generational. So these heavy metals, because they stay in our system, they get passed down from generation to generation. And I have done whole family heavy metal tests now, and I will tell you, you can see the lead is the highest in mom. It'll be the second highest in the firstborn. Then it's it's a little bit lower in the se- in the second born, and a little bit lower in the third born. And you can see the whole pattern. So when I look at my family history, mom had osteoporosis, and she had thyroid problems. We haven't tested her her lead because. I just didn't know. It's a, it's a provoked test that I like to do, and I didn't feel like that was going to be something that I could put my you know seventy year old at the time mom through. Um, my sister, so she had those issues: thyroid and osteoporosis and chronic pain. My sister, at in her fifties, started to get or in late forties, started to get thyroid problems. So we tested her lead. Her lead was one of the highest I've ever seen. And then in my early 40s, I started to get sleeping challenges, depression, memory issues, um, hot flashes, and my level of lead was a little less than my sister's. So it's it's generational and it's being passed down. And if if that's the first time you're hearing that, I get that that sounds crazy until you dive into it. Just go go to Google Scholar and type in generational toxicity lead and you will see the research on it. So for you, Mindy, in your case, you waited till perimenopause. And this was interesting. I didn't know that because of the hormones at that time, you can expel lead from from the bones. That's fascinating. Yeah. But given what you know now, how would you have gone about dealing with that before it became a problem? So if you could go back to, say, 20, 30-year-old Mindy... Would you do that provocation test and then and then do the similar protocol you did later? For people yeah. that might not know right now where they stand, who should get the testing done? It sounds like all of us are affected to some level. How does the quote unquote average person right now who hasn't had symptoms from it determine where they're at? Should they do testing? Yeah. I'll let you take yeah, it from it's there. Yeah, it's a great question. So the first thing you can do is you can just look at patterns. So look at the patterns in your family and then look at the patterns in your life. So some of the big things that we know heavy metals affect are chronic fatigue, um, memory issues, mood disorders, thyroid problems, um, inability to lose weight. Um, and then um, you you also see a lot of like learning disabilities. So you can look for those patterns in family and go, you know, we call it genetic because everybody has a thyroid problem in the family, but could there be something else in there? And that's where we, we start to see lead show up. In that, to answer that one, um, I had a, I had reading um, challenges, reading comprehension challenges when I was a kid. I now know that was part, part of that was lead. Um, after I had my son, my second child, I had a thyroid problem. That was lead coming out through pregnancy because that's another time postpartum uh, depression can be a, an influx or an outflux of this lead ap- after pregnancy. And then I had the perimenopausal issues. So uh, the cool thing about where I caught it at, at perimenopause, is I corrected it. And I will tell you my thyroid, I've never had a problem with my thyroid. And I strongly feel that's because I stopped it in my early 40s. So, but to answer your question, so I just I just want to kind of help people see the lifelong view of these heavy metals and where they show up. To answer your question, I, if I could go back to you know the younger version of me, I would in my twenties I would have tested and I would have detoxed and I would have done that before I got pregnant. 
because I see the pattern in my daughter, who's my firstborn. Uh, I don't see it as much in my son, the second, the second child. But in the first one, I see some some issues around, you know, anxiety, um, trouble sleeping, and I realize, yeah, there's a toxic load there. So yeah, we've been teaching her how to detox now at 23. And for somebody who either has testing done and realizes they have metals in their body, or they just assume to do the detox. Is this something you'd want to work with somebody? Because I've heard if you're not doing it correctly, you can end up reabsorbing the to- the metals and toxins. Talk about what what somebody to do if they they want to do this the right way. Yeah, thank you for saying that because it's not like you can just drink celery juice in the morning or decide that you're going to take some Corella and all of a sudden now all the heavy metals out of your body. Um, there are three phases to detoxing heavy metals. You got to prepare the detox organs. So that's liver support, gut support, lymph, make sure your lymph is moving, um, make sure you're sleeping so that you're or at least committing to try to get some good sleep so that your brain, you know, it will detox at night. You got to be sweating, make sure you're doing some breath work. And then, you know, what we do, we have a program called the Thrive Program where we teach this. What we do is we power people up with supplements to it temporarily to increase the detox organs so that they're well supported. And we, and that can last anywhere from a month to three months, depending on how weak those organs are. Then you got to pull it out of the body because you got to think of the body as like, if you're going to detox the brain, it's going to go into the body. So the body actually has to be prepared for the detox effect that you're going to try to create in the brain. So we usually spend a month or a couple months detoxing the body, um, and then the third phase will go to the brain and we'll detox the brain. So it, it can take six months to a year to, to help somebody detox properly. It's crazy the results when you're thorough and you're patient and you understand that process, how ridiculously effective that is. So to your point, it's not as simple as if somebody stands up there and they're like, take this supplement or do this chelation. We, you got to use binders. You have to cycle in and out. I mean, there's so, there's an art to it. And that's, you know, we teach it, other people teach it, but I, I, my goal when I teach it is I want to teach somebody how to detox. So A, they don't need us anymore. And B, they can learn how to detox for life because we're not, the world is not getting any less toxic. For somebody who might just have a little bit of metals or different toxins in their body, they're not at the point where it's severe, it's affecting them, but now they're aware and they want to live preventatively and also chelate out if there's a little bit of, you know, accumulation is yeah. there something that people can do on their own that's more gentle if they're not in that severe case where they need to work with a practitioner? Yeah. Or is it just recommended to work with a practitioner? Oh, no, I think this is good because I always like to go, okay, what's what can we do today after you listen to this podcast? You know, and I think that's, thank you for bringing that up because the goal is not like, health shouldn't be expensive for everybody. Like we got to have some daily routines we can do that keep us moving in the right direction. That's why I love fasting. Um, So for starters, look at your toxic load. So scan your whole environment. One of my favorite apps is called Think Dirty. And you can take Think Dirty and go around your whole house. Look, And mostly it'll be your beauty products and just see what's in there, see what the toxic load is. You can go to the Environmental Working Group site and you can actually type in your zip code and it'll tell you what's in your water. You can They have lists upon lists of toxins. So your first goal when you're detoxing is stop the influx. When you go to the dentist, don't let them put, you know, um, the silver fillings in your mouth. Like, and you, and some people may want to actually get some of them removed by, by, by a proper dentist, like a biological dentist, but let's stop the influx. Second thing you can do is open up your detox pathways. So the, I, I mentioned this before, which is sweating. Are you sweating every day? Uh, breath work. Are you doing breath work where, you know, like that Wim Hof breathing is phenomenal. Are you moving? Are you getting out and getting circulation going through your system? Um, And then are you sleeping? Because at night your brain shrinks. 
so that the that the cerebral spinal fluid can go up and can wash the brain every night. So are you committed to sleep? Are you getting enough deep sleep? This is why I love all the biometric wearables right now, because um, we can see how much deep sleep we're getting. That's the first number I look at every morning is like, how much deep sleep did I get? Because I know that's how my brain detoxes. You quickly mentioned there when you're going through that whole array of different areas, the water quality which got me thinking about filtering water, which got me further thinking about different areas beyond water that we want to filter, whether that be air, our shower, our water. What are the different, again, it fits into this realm of being preventative and and stopping the accumulation. What different areas do you personally make sure you're filtering? Well, air and water for sure. And I, and I, I feel like I've just keep adding to the water filters like, because they're the I mean it's the water is you know we here in America it's like we we look at other third world countries and we're like oh it's so sad they don't have clean water but we don't even realize we don't have clean water. So um so definitely water filters are are massively important and then air filters. I'll tell you where I have the, uh, uh, there's it's a non-negotiable for me. I have a major air filter in my bedroom. Because at night is when I'm I'm looking that as a as a detox um, uh, opportunity. So um, so that those are the two biggest. Um, and then you know something as simple as do you have a daily bowel movement? You know a lot of people like I sat with so many patients when I would ask them like how how are your bowel movements? And they would say oh yeah they're pretty good. Like I I think I go every three or four days. Okay, that's not a good bowel movement. You want to go every single day and you need to get the stuff out that your body's trying to get rid of. So there's things like that. Um, We've got coffee enemas and castor oil packs to open up the liver. I think that's phenomenal. Um, And we we have to look at a lot of these new detox strategies and realize that the reason we need more strategies is because we live in the most toxic time in human history. It's 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 such a depressing topic. <laughs> so if you're like listening to this and you're like, oh my God, I can't keep up, I hear you. And you're living in a different world today than you did 30 years ago. So we've got to start to adapt our lifestyle to this crazy new world that we're living in. And it's a lot up front and it's a lot of learning, you know, shows like this and different readings. But when you make the shifts, a lot of it's just, easy maintenance after that. So it's, it's can be a lot for people, but you know, and you also don't need to do it all today. You can take a piece of this. This is a long conversation. We've shared a lot here, take a piece, build some inertia and then just continue building on that. Yeah. You know, like makeup, makeup's a big one. A lot of women that I talk to are like, no, like I'm not, my makeup is perfect. My favorite perfume that I've worn forever. Like I am not changing that. So then I go, okay, well, go to Think Dirty and let's just see what score it gets because it'll score it. And then they come back and they're like, oh my God, this, it scored a seven, which is would be horrible, or a six would be bad. Anything over a three is bad. And so my recommendation is, and the, the, the next thing typically they'll say is, but my makeup's so expensive. And I'll say, okay, just when you run out, what I'm going to ask is that you try to find a cleaner version. And you use, you know, replace it one by one by one. And maybe at the end of a year, you've got it completely replaced. And, and, and I think that's the way that we can approach this. Otherwise it's, it's quite a daunting task. Yeah. We definitely don't want to stop people in their tracks feeling overwhelmed. And I think it depends on the person too. If somebody's tuning into this and they have a chronic disease, you know, they're type two diabetic or they have cancer, they might need to make well, I would say they need to make more radical shifts in their health quicker than somebody who is 23 and feeling good, but wants to live a long, healthy lifestyle. So you yes. mentioned, you know, taking a year with the makeup, you know, the latter example there, that might be more applicable in that situation. So again, like everything we're talking about today, it's very nuanced and we're giving a general idea, but everybody's different and they need to apply what we're saying to their unique situation. That's super well said, because if you're facing a diagnosis, you're going to want to, everything I just talked about, or we've been talking about is like, 
yeah, you want to take it with the utmost seriousness and and really dive in to look at your food, look at your where your toxic load may be, your makeups, your supplements, your household cleaners, like your internal environment if you have a scary diagnosis. If you're listening to this and you're like, okay, I just don't want a scary diagnosis or I want to slow down aging or I want more energy, okay, then let's slowly unwind this toxic load that you have. And I think I think that's the conversation that's the most helpful for all of us. Because what I noticed in health is if we're overwhelmed, we don't take action. And I love this idea that that people don't need motivation to be healthy, they need momentum. And so you can build momentum by just starting to make small change after small change and just watch how everything in your life and your energy and your brain and your sleep and watch how it changes. That would be what I would tell like the 23 year old is just, let's just start looking at where toxins are infiltrating in and what can we get rid of? Whereas the 45 year old that was just given a breast cancer diagnosis, you know, now's the time. Like we got to dive all in. I agree. And when you're talking about your filtration for your water, it sounds like it's been an evolution and you've come to this, this powerful spot now. What are you doing for your water? Oh my God. Do you want to know? Okay. I have three things. So the first is I'm a big fan of reverse osmosis. So unfortunately in my zip code, they put fluoride in our water and I'm, that's a neurotoxin. So I, I want to make sure that filters out. So I have a reverse osmosis system. The second thing is I have in my kitchen a hy- hydrogen water. Have you tried hydrogen water? I have. What do you think of it? Is that with the capsules? No, mine actually comes through a filter system. It's by Synergy Science. And, um, and what it does is it's just hydrogen and we're back at the microbes. What it does is it really helps change the terrain of your gut and helps feed the microbes in a positive way. So my drinking water is now reverse osmosis with hydrogen water um, so that I'm feeding my microbes. So that's my drinking water. And then I just added something else in. Um, I don't know if you know Analemma, but they have a coherent water filter that actually makes sure that the water, all water coming into your house, not just drinking water, but the water you're showering in is the, uh, the harmonic frequency of our cells. And, and the way that, that Mario, who created the product, calls it is that it is geared towards making sure that the cell is in a state of love. So I just added that in. And you know, here's the funny part of that story is that my 23-year-old moved home temporarily. And I'm like, hmm, let's see how that, if, if this is going to change the vibration of everybody in the house. So, um, But I'm not telling everybody to do that. I'm just saying that's how crazy I've gotten with water. No, and it's fun. And again, you've been doing this for a yeah. long time and evolved to that place. I've tried some kind of hydrogen and water. I've tried a lot of things different companies have sent and I enjoyed it, but I'll have to look into this, what you're talking about here. You know what You know what shocked me with my hydrogen water? It's called a Echo O2 machine. Uh, and you can just go to Synergy Science, um, is that when I water fast, it, it killed my hunger. So the first time I got it in my house, like on a Monday and Wednesday, I started a three-day water fast. Both my husband and I did. And my husband's the biggest skeptic when it comes to all of this stuff. And I'm like, supposedly it kills your hunger. And that was the easiest three-day water fast both of us have ever done. By the third day, we're like, I guess, should we keep going? I don't know. Like we were just not hungry. It was really weird. So- Sometimes, this is also interesting, Jesse, is sometimes we're hungry because our microbes are hungry, not because we need food. So what happens is hydrogen water supplies that and is part of why it kills hunger. And you're you're doing RO at the beginning, removing everything from the water. Do you add minerals back in? It's a great question. I do I do do a ton of minerals every day. I've got, I mean, that would be another one, liquid minerals that I've been adding in. Um, so yes, I do add minerals back in. Mindy, earlier when you were talking about doing a cold plunge sauna combo, you mentioned having a, a CGM on your arm and, and seeing that spike, which brings me to wanting to talk about blood sugar in a general sense, because- 
I think for a lot of people, for me, this was a later entry into my realm and and being cognizant and making different food decisions based on that. Yeah. So let's talk about for somebody who feels like at this point, you know, they've made dietary switches, they're eating organic, they're eating grass fed, grass finished, but the blood sugar piece still isn't something they've taken into account. Let's talk about what, let's just start off in, in a broad sense, why that matters. Yeah. Metabolic health matters for everything. It matters for hormonal health. It matters for immune system, brain function, everything. So what I've noticed is if I can go to the most simple concept that the body has to be able to do to to heal and to let all other systems work, it is we have to have balanced blood sugar. So, but here's the crazy part. This is the mind-blowing part, is that it's our microbes, we're back in the microbes, that are going to determine when we eat a meal what the blood sugar level will be uh, from that meal. So a lot of people I saw in my world, in in the fasting world, they were like, I'm doing everything you're telling me, but I can't seem to get into ketosis and I can't seem to bring my blood sugar down. That is a microbial imbalance that's contributing to a blood sugar spike. And when the blood sugar goes up, you're not able to switch over into ketosis enough to be able to get that benefit. That is a very nuanced piece of this conversation. But it's important because what we're seeing is that if I can put a CGM on somebody and I can work on the quality of their meals. I have this going on right now. I've been working with um, a very popular actress who's in her 30s, and we're trying to get her hormones back on track. Okay, I didn't start with giving her a bunch of fancy supplements. I started with, how do we get your blood sugar stable? And she, had a, she was really leaning towards a vegan lifestyle. And so we put it on and I said, okay, just eat what you normally eat. And there were like a ton of spikes going up and down and up and down. And so now what I have her doing is, okay, can you put a fat with each one of those meals and let's see what the spikes do? Well, the spikes started coming down. Then I said, okay, can we add some protein in there? And this is where I'm not anti-vegetarian, but I had to get her to add in a little more either protein powder. She's exper- she was a pescatarian. So she's experimenting with a little more meats, you know, and, and adding those in with each meal. And you just see the blood sugar stabilizing. Just it, in one week, we dramatically shifted this. Now, now that I've got her seeing how to put the right co- blend of foods together, Now I can teach her fasting. Now I can teach her her hormones. But we can't move forward with people's health if that if those blood sugar spikes are still high and low. It makes everything else we do so much more difficult. Got it. So the first step is getting the blood sugar regulated. This is new information to me where you talked about the microbiome being why there's that person to person variance because I've known about the variance and that's why the CGM can be so powerful because we're going to all react differently to different foods. But now I know why the microbiome, that's that's interesting. And so starting with that, we want to get our blood sugar regulated. And, and coming back to how I opened up the blood sugar piece, why this is so important, I want to make sure I hammer this home, the fact that you can be eating the cleanest diet, and, and you, you touched on this too, the fact that a lot of plant-based diets are going to be higher in carbs and they're going to cause those fluctuations in blood sugar more so. People can think they're doing everything right, but there's, there's different levels to this diet where you want to make sure you're not, you want to make sure you're bringing in the proper nutrition. You want to make sure you're not bringing in toxins with that food. So that's where organic and grass-fed and better quality choices make sense. Then another layer is to make sure it's not spiking your blood sugar. Yes. So it's like you have to, you have to, it's like a 3D um, effect here. And you have to consider all the different pieces when it comes to how you're eating. You got it. And I think this is why I fell in love with fasting is because, you know, you're, li- again, I would just want to honor the people listening to this that are like, what, what do I need to do? But I want you to understand this is why so many people are sick. 
is because we haven't talked about quality of food. We haven't talked about combination of food in the terms of the blood sugar issue. And uh, I'm sure you saw the article that came out in, during the pandemic that showed only 12% or 12% of Americans are metabolically healthy. Everybody else is metabolically unhealthy. Like we have a very, very small percentage of Americans that are metabolically fit. And the reason is because we're just eating for our taste buds and these toxins and high sugared foods have just infiltrated our system, our, our food system. So we've got to take a step back. And what I found is fasting was the quickest way to change somebody's metabolic health. It's the fastest. So please make sure that you're fasting. But then the next thing would be exactly what you and I are talking about. Before you go keto and you start counting macros and you start getting into that, what's the food combination you're doing? You know, are you having protein and fat with every meal? Um, I don't know if you remember the, um, the glycemic index was really popular years ago. We don't really talk about it anymore because there's so much, you know, you could eat a banana and your microbes might love it. And they use it well, and it stabilizes your blood sugar. And I eat a banana, and all of a sudden, I've got a huge glucose spike. So there's just a, like this personalized approach to nutrition is emerging. And if you put a CGM on, you'll be able to see what is working for you. That's the only way I know how to do it, which is why I love that tool. And what's coming up for me as we talk about this, the fact that because it comes back to the microbiome, because as we eat different foods, that's going to change over a lifetime. Different foods are going to impact blood glucose differently at different phases. Yeah. So it's not enough to take a CGM for a month and, and learn how you react to all your favorite foods. You know, a couple of years down the line, if you've been eating different foods and different fermented foods and taking a probiotic and the microbiome's different, my hunch is that it's going to affect how, your pro how the microbiome is going to process foods. Oh, it's, you're exactly right. And, and really good point. First time I put a CGM on was before we had them easily accessible like we do now. A friend of mine had a, a type one diabetic daughter and she was swapping out her, her reader and asked me if I wanted to put one on. I'm like, yeah, of course I want to try it. And that what I noticed at that point was when I ate protein, my blood sugar spiked like quite a bit. So then through all the principles that we've been teaching here, through the, the fasting and, and eating for my cycle, um, a year later, I put, we finally started to have these at-home um, readers that were so easy to get. I put one on, and this has been a consistent finding me for, for a while, is that when I eat protein, my blood sugar drops. That's a change in my microbiome. And that's without a probiotic, that's doing all the things we're talking about here. That's fasting, that's fermented foods, that's variety, diversity of foods. Like I just spend a lot of time working on my microbiome. And because of that, I see the changes now in my blood sugar when I eat. I want to make sure we have the order right here for people that are new to all this. Is it get the diet right, level out blood glucose, and then include fasting? I like it that way. I think it's the easiest way to do it. Um, but if you're struggling with cravings or you're struggling to make just food changes in general, pair it with something as simple as 13 hours of fasting and it'll get easier. But I, you know, everybody wants to t ask me, what's the first door into fasting? And I always say it's food. It's food. If you, you could, you can jump into fasting on, after having a Western standard diet, but it may be a little painful. So if we clean up the diet a little bit and then we go to fasting, now we're going to have, find that natural rhythm and you're going to, and then your food choices are going to be different. So, so anyway, so that, that's one approach that I've seen. Now, I, I, I do want to point out that there are some people that are food addicted and that, that's a challenge because they can't seem to undo their cravings for some crazy things. So I'll give you an example. I had a man that came to me last year that was 300 pounds and he wanted to lose weight. And um, I said, tell me what your hurdle is. And he's like, I'm food addicted. I can't, I, I can't get off my horrible diet. He was drinking 12 sodas a day. So now logically, anybody listening to this would be like, well, dude, get off your 12 sodas a day and you're gonna lose weight. But he told me, 
that he was food addicted and he really struggled to be able to overcome that food addiction. So I just started compressing his eating window and I got him to 15 hours of fasting. Uh, first month without changing his food, he was eating the standard horrible diet with 12 sodas a day. He lost 15, like 13 to 15 pounds that first month just by, by eating when, changing when he eats. Second month, I went in, I said, can we just up your protein? The reason that we upped protein is because it'll kill hunger. So I was like trying to see if I could, and it also, remember, protein will increase uh, muscle size, improve insulin receptors in the muscle. So there's a lot of benefits to protein. So I was like, okay, let's just add some protein in. So we did that second month. He lost nine pounds. Third month, I said, could you just take your sodas and, and drink them outside of the house? So every time you're in the house, you're not drinking soda, but you can have it outside the house. So he's still compressed his eating window. He's still upping his protein. And now his sodas are outside his house, loses another 12 pounds. So the guy's like down like almost 40 pounds in three months, still eating buffalo wings and French fries. Um, we kept working at that. Within six months, he was completely off soda so and continuing to lose weight. So there are, I say that to say there are some cases where we can use fasting to help overcome the craving and then add in some of this food that is really good, like protein, and then we will start to see that people are willing to let go of the old habits. Again, coming back to our common theme where it's going to depend on the person and there's nuance yeah. to all this. Yep. I want to touch on something you quickly mentioned the fact that when people want to start controlling their blood sugar and stopping it from spiking as much, they want to include fat and protein with the carbs. Let's give people some other hacks when they want to begin to help control blood sugar, how they go about eating, what they're eating, maybe different supplements or foods they can take to help regulate that. Yeah. Well, let's keep it really simple because we've gotten really deep. So I just want to honor if you've listened this far, like I get there's a lot of nuance and I appreciate Jesse, you taking me into the nuance because um, I think it's important. We It's like the complete picture that everybody needs to hear. So let's start with, look at the combination of the meal you're putting together. Is there a fat? Is there a protein? Is there a carb? And is that carb nature's carbs, not a refined carb? Like that is like really good start to managing blood sugar. Second thing before you go rush out and buy a supplement is one of the greatest things you can do post meal is go for a walk. Like just use that glucose. So that night walk, you know, after dinner is amazing. If you can't walk, then squats, just do some squats in a room. Um, and because your legs, your, your thighs and your glutes are big muscles. So if you just do 25, 50 squats after every single big meal, you're going to start to use force that glucose to go into the muscles and power up the muscles. So super easy to do those. The, and they don't cost any money, either of those. Um, my third hack, one that everybody loves and I resisted doing this video on YouTube. Everybody asked me for the longest time, could you please talk about apple cider vinegar? And I was like, okay, I don't really like apple cider vinegar, but there are some cool benefits. And the science shows that if you have a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, either before your meal or even post meal, that it has the benefit of balancing your blood sugar. So try some apple cider vinegar around that meal and see how you do. Now, beyond that, we've got things like cinnamon and berberine, and we've got some other really interesting nutrients. So let's, let's put this in the context of like a faster. Let's say you drink coffee and you like having some milk in it and, it and it spikes your blood sugar. Try putting some cinnamon in it. See if you can start to, and see how that will potentially lower your blood sugar. So there, those are some good hacks. Berberina, obviously, you got to get through a supplement. Um, but I like those hacks before I reach for a supplement. Again, the supplement should be supplementing a lifestyle that is regulating blood sugar. An important area I want to make sure we hit on that ties into all this while we talk about blood sugar is insulin. And it's come up a couple times. Yeah. So... Let's tie this into insulin resistance and insulin behind the scenes as we're spiking our blood sugar, what's happening there? 
So remember that that insulin is the, is the glucose storing hormone. So it's going to push glucose into the cell so your cells can use it. Every time you eat and your blood sugar spikes, insulin goes up. So we go back to this the conversation when you're getting these spikes going up and down and up and down. What's happening is each spike there's a there's another set of insulin going going into your system. The more spikes we have of insulin throughout a day, at some point, two things happen. One is the cells become deaf to it. Anybody who has a kid knows the more you ask them, the less they're willing to do it. And, or I always say sometimes husbands are that way too. And so, you know, it, it's the more, more uh, insulin, the less the cells are able to use it. So the spikes really, really matter. Second thing that I want to point out on insulin and glucose, and this is one that I think is really not talked enough about, and that is that when you have all this extra sugar, when you have all this extra insulin and the cells can't use it, your body has to store it. So where will it store it? And it stores it in fat. Now, let's think about what we do. We go and we look in the mirror and we see the areas that are uh, are fat on us and we villainize it. Ah, I must not be disciplined enough. I, you know, why is it showing up that way? But really your body just found a place to store fat to save your life. It didn't want to store it in your heart and lungs, didn't want to store it in your liver because that ultimately that will be your demise. So we've got to, the name of the insulin game is make less of it. And you can do that through all the strategies we're talking about with glucose. Manage glucose and you won't get get insulin spikes throughout the day. And with less insulin spikes comes less need to store both glucose and insulin as fat. And the scary thing about insulin is behind the scenes, as we're causing insulin spikes and building up insulin resistance... That can happen in the background for years without any signs or symptoms while it's destroying your health. That's right. So, you know, it's important to be aware of all this because insulin resistance, again, can be destroying things and you only realize that later on down the line when things are totally falling apart. A really good measurement of where you are on the insulin glucose sensitivity um, range is hemoglobin A1c. So you're, if you're getting yearly blood work, your doctor's doing hemoglobin A1C. If it's above five, then you are moving towards insulin resistance. If it's at five or less, you're, you, you've got great glucose insulin sensitivity. And I, and I want to point out one thing on hemoglobin A1C that is not talked about enough. If your hemoglobin A1C is 5.5 or it's six, yes, they'll say you're pre-diabetic or you're diabetic. But really what that means is that your red red blood cells, which are the cells that carry oxygen, are gummed up with glucose molecules. So they're not getting oxygen to your brain. They're not getting oxygen to your your skin, to your muscles. You are not getting oxygenated because the glucose got stuck on the outside of that red blood cell. I personally think... um, the two biggest measurements on blood tests that everybody should look at and everybody should run every year is they need to look at hemoglobin A1C and vitamin D. Those two are massively important for our long-term health. I just want to make sure I'm clear because I didn't know this. Hemoglobin A1C will catch insulin resistance? Yes. Because the way I yes. understood it, it was blood glucose can be high for a period of time. We make more and more insulin as we become more resistant trying to bring that glucose into the cells. And then again, we don't realize that we're having all kinds of blood sugar problems because we're making more insulin till years down the line and we're insulin resistant. But you're saying the A1C test will catch that. Yeah, because think about it. Insulin's there to push glucose into the, into the cell so it can be used for energy by the mitochondria. But if hemoglobin A1C is high, that meant that the extra glucose not only went to fat, but it's gumming up the red blood cell. So insulin, that insulin system is not being used properly. Lots to think about here today. Beautiful in-depth conversation. We went deep. We covered a lot of different ground. Mindy, we're going to link up all the books in the show notes. We're going to link up your social media, your website, everything. Round two has been a real pleasure. Thank you for coming back on the show. 
Oh, thank you, Jesse. This has been a delight. So I, I hope we didn't lose people in, in all the nuance, but this is definitely a conversation that needed to be had. So thank you so much. I agree. Thank you. Now that you're done my conversation with Dr. Mindy, you're going to want to head over here and catch my previous chat with her. We go even deeper into fasting. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. So if you want to lose weight, I, I really feel like the first thing we've got to look at is when you eat, not what you eat. Coffee makes...